Hey, Static Crusaders, welcome back to our special about the true history and meaning of separation of church and state. Incredibly important to give us some more historical insight into what our founding fathers were thinking, how they grew up, like the culture they grew up in and what they expected. Uh, Richard Reinsch is here. He's at the Heritage Foundation. He's the director of the Simon Center for American Studies at the wonderful Heritage Foundation. Richard, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Grateful you're here. So we just talked about Roger Williams, and then we led into the Danbury Baptists, the letter that he, they wrote to Thomas Jefferson, and what Thomas Jefferson wrote back, the, the, the true meaning of the separation of church and state. It's the opposite of what we think it is today. What do we need to know about that letter, and what do we need to know about that time period uh, to help this all make sense for us? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So Jefferson pins the letter in 1802, to the Danbury Baptist. And you know, the political context of this letter, Jefferson's just been through a very bruising presidential campaign in 1800. He's been accused by his Federalist opponents of being an infidel, uh, an atheist, hostile to religion. He comes into the White House, he's the president. Um, he attends uh, religious services, which are held in federal buildings. So he attends church services in federal buildings uh, he supports and signs legislation that appropriated money for the printing of a Bible, and he supported missionary efforts to Native American tribes at the time. So Jefferson himself did not regard this principle that he uh, that, that it's come to be interpreted as as operative necessarily to his public conduct. He writes this letter to the Danbury Baptist because there's this continued accusations against him for not issuing proclamations of thanksgiving, prayer, and fasting that John Adams and George Washington, his predecessors, had issued. So he writes this letter to the Danbury Baptist, explaining himself, as it were, to them. The Danbury Baptists are in Connecticut. They are religious dissenters in that state. The Congregationalists have uh, official state control. They have been uh, intolerant towards the Baptists in, in various ways. And Jefferson writes to them uh, to suggest that he does not sympathize or support the treatment that they've received. He thinks there should be a high wall of separation between church and state. But what's crucial there for Jefferson is this is about state governments and churches, or I should say the federal government and churches. He's not necessarily speaking to state governments because the, under, the constitutional understanding at the time was the First Amendment applied only to the federal government. And what it meant was do not establish a national church or have federal law take cognizance of religion. That is to say, impose official disabilities, legal disabilities on people uh, for their real religious creed that they happen to be in. States were very different. The state governments could, uh, there were state churches at the time, they could, uh, they had strong support, uh, law supporting morality, religion, things like that. And so he is writing to say, high wall of separation between the federal government uh, and religious congregations. It's not a dispassionate assessment by Jefferson. He is, this is not someone necessarily speaking and uh, as a scholar of, of constitutional law, this is someone speaking very politically and very charged. When he writes that mm -hmm. metaphor to them of the wall of separation, high wall of separation, um, he's also revealing that, you know, Thomas Jefferson was, was not a framer. He's not in the Constitutional Convention that gives us the Constitution, and he's not a part of any of the state ratifying conventions that are going to call for a Bill of Rights, which the Bill of Rights is then going to get introduced by Madison, the first Congress. When Jefferson uh, says that, he's really outside of a strong consensus at the American founding and in the early republic, and, and which holds throughout much of our history, that freedom and virtue go together. They rise and fall together. If we're going to be a free people, we have to be a virtuous people. If we're going to be a virtuous people, then we need strong religion. And that means that government, rather than being hostile to religion, are neutral to religion, should support it uh, and foster it. And so when he writes that metaphor, even the Danbury Baptist, according to one historian, Daniel Dreisbach, they're even taken uh, aback a bit uh, by this metaphor, because what it would seem to suggest is there could be, there's just, there's a barrier between religion and state, and religion couldn't even influence uh, the government in, in various ways. And most people of religious faith, uh, and, and the Danbury Baptists are no exception, don't leave their faith at home or in the closet. It's a part of their life. It's an integrating part of their life. It's how they think, speak, and act. And they necessarily want to do that in a political vein when they're being political. So there's, 
there's all sorts of problems uh, with the metaphor, but it's, it's become widely misinterpreted. Americans think, for example, it's many Americans, if you poll them, think that it's actually in the Constitution. It's not. It's cited for the first time by the Supreme Court in 1947 in the Everson case. The Everson case involved parents receiving state money uh, to fund religious education during school hours. Um, uh, the money that uh, that was used, there was no like, uh, you know, it could be used for any religion, uh, religious education. And the court upholds the law, but introduces this principle that they get from Jefferson, wow. high wall of separation of church and state. It's impregnable. We could not approve of the slightest breach. And what, what begins to happen after this opinion is this, it, it, it gets applied to thinking about the establishment clause. And it begins to, you know, taint and obstruct free exercise of religion. And you get the situation where free exercise becomes impossible because it's seen as, if it interacts in any way with, with government, as sort of uh, establishing religion. So you, you have this distortion uh, throughout our, our religious clause jurisprudence for the next 70 to 80 years of, wow. of a secularist republic that can have no interaction really between the state and churches. Of course, it's untenable. It's unworkable. And so the Supreme Court at the same time has to come up with all manner of unprincipled compromises. I mean, are we going to have congressional chaplains? Are we going to have military chaplains? Are we going to strike out a lot of ways in which you know, we have prayers uh, in various public forum? And you know, the court shifts. It meanders. There's no principled way for, to reconcile this. Are we going to have uh, you know, we have many towns in America with with you know, religious names. So how are you going to come down on all of these? Uh, are you going to, are churches no longer going to receive official state protection? Are they going to be outside of the sphere of all the laws because we can't have any intermingling? And they have no way really to resolve this. So it's, it's not a helpful metaphor in the law. It's, it's a confusing metaphor. And I think the history of it is it was applied in a very secularist manner. Separation of church and state. You know, it's not in the Constitution. It's not in the Declaration of Independence. Where did that term come from? And actually, it's before Thomas Jefferson. We need to understand this. Why? Because we live in a pagan culture. And the pagan church is imposing their morals and values on you. And if you try to do anything about it, oh, there's a separation of church and state. It's like, no, no, no. You guys got that completely backwards. Abortion, gay marriage, transgender kids. What is going on? We need to fully understand the true meaning of separation of church and state. It's the opposite of what they tell you it is. That is on our special right now, Separation Church and State, available on our app, the First TV app. You can download that on any app store and at thefirsttv.com.